I don't make a difference between life and science. It's all the same for me. So what is your inspiration in your research? Obsession. Uh, the inspiration of my research is I can't resist thinking about certain questions, and I lie awake night thinking about those questions. And it's like a hungry man uh, thinks about food. I think about philosophical questions. Apparently, Kasia, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is apparently the longest straight street in in Europe. Which, uh, which, 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 which Professor Searle was a natural candidate for this academic honor. Our department is probably the only department of pragmatics in the world that is focused on studying the pragmatics of language in line with the philosophy of language as developed by Professor Searle. What is the nature of our life? What is the nature of our experience? What is the nature of the society that we live in? How shall we explain the very existence of life and consciousness and language and mind and society? And that's philosophy. That's the sort of stuff I do. And I think anybody's bound to be interested in those questions. What I find most inspiring and fascinating about Professor Searle's research is his philosophy of social ontology, in which he tries to explain how it is possible that we have societies, social institutions, that we have governments. How is it possible for a $100 note to have the value it has? And how does the institution of marriage come into being? And finally, how is it possible that thanks to a certain social agreement, the social reality, social facts and social phenomena exist? We have a saying in Poland that a word can kill. It can inspire, but it can also kill. Would you agree with that proverb? It isn't usually just one word, uh, but it's the idea expressed by the word. And I will give you uh, some uh, spectacular examples. Uh, most of us who are as old as I am remember when we thought that the Soviet empire would go on more or less indefinitely. And in Annus Mirabilis 1989, it collapsed. And one of the most amazing places was Poland. And, and, and uh, an amazing thing, in, in Poland, the collapse of communism was partly not just a victory for Poland, but a, but a victory of a certain idea of Poland, even a religious idea of Poland. And there, it was a, not just a single word, but it was a cluster of ideas that I think led to the undermining of an entire empire. I would like to extend my warm greetings to Professor John Searle from the University of California in Berkeley and Professor Pieter Pellenberg from the University of Groningen. Professor John Searle is undoubtedly one of the most outstanding figures in contemporary humanities. His works are a significant contribution to the philosophy of language and philosophy of mind and have become a point of reference and a source of inspiration in numerous fields of contemporary linguistics, philosophy, cognitive sciences, research on artificial intelligence, as well as society and economy-oriented research. Do you feel you are more a philosopher of language, mind, or society? All three. And all three are really part of being a philosopher. The, the main question in philosophy today, for me, and I think for most philosophers, is how do we, how do we give an account of the human reality with its uh, meaning, language, poetry, art, aesthetics, rationality, science, and free will, and uh, 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 ethics, how do we give an account of that in a world that according to physics consists of mindless, meaningless, physical particles? Now the key point 
at making the connection is the notion of consciousness and the mind. I had a chance to observe the way he works, the way in which his ideas are born. He gets up very early in the morning and starts his day in a very active way with jogging. I don't know to what extent he keeps this routine during his trips, or round trips, when he gives lectures all over the world. But he's already up at seven and turns up at the university as soon as possible. He begins with checking his emails and then focuses on writing his articles. Or in fact, he often records his thoughts, goes for a walk and records thoughts that will later take up a dozen pages. As I was uh, listening uh, to these talks, it occurs to me, a moment like this is not a celebration of, <clears throat> of an individual, but of an institution, the university. And not just this university, but universities worldwide. It's a wonderful institution. Science cannot exist for the sake of science only. Fortunately, and this is what fascinates me most in pragmatics and in the field of philosophy of language related to pragmatics, we analyze the, the mystifying function of language. We are interested in what is hidden behind the words in their implicit meaning, their manipulatory potential and uh, propaganda value, and also their social use in the negative sense, when they are used to gain control over people's minds. These are the areas of interest of pragmatics, which is very socially oriented. I would like to read Rothschild Duck in Cherries, and before that I'd like some Polish beer and maybe uh, if we have a first course, I would like uh, what is typical Polish herring or something like that. Professor Searle, are you on any diet in general? Yes, yeah, I, I eat only very good food. What are your passions outside philosophy, outside science? Do you have any time for them? My, other than philosophy, the thing I like to do best is skiing. I ski a lot. And I used to race, I don't race anymore, it's too bad, but um, I ski a lot and I like to hike and I travel a lot. A Western academic is someone who is very open-minded, has other passions beyond his field of research. I think such a model of an academic is gaining ground in Poland. What matters is not only a narrow field of research, but the ability to understand the world fascination with the world and a wide range of phenomena in this world. And Professor Searle can be a perfect example here. If 
Our world is dominated by politics and violence. Is there any chance for free will, which you have so extensively discussed in your work? Well, we have to presuppose when we make choices that we are cho choosing among genuine alternatives. But to make a choice among genuine alternatives is to assume, though I'm doing this, I could be doing that. And that is to assume free will. Professor Searle. Professor Searle, as he himself admitted, started with the philosophy of language. Afterwards, he realized that language is a phenomenon of the mind, so it would be worth looking at phenomena originating in the brain. And he got into the philosophy of mind, and I think this is his main philosophical fascination, to which he always returns, and other directions of his research are related to it or revolve around it. It is the core of his philosophy. If you are an author and a lecturer, you always wonder, is anybody listening? Does it make any difference? Do they read the books I write? And it's wonderful if it turns out, yes, some people do read the books and they listen to the lectures and it makes a difference. And this is a great honor because they are saying that it makes a difference to them and that makes a great difference to me. If you are interested in what it means to be a human being, you're already interested in philosophy.